It's almost as if it was deliberately designed to look ugly. Until you got inside, you realized how fantastically precious it really was. Scripture, meditating on your scripture. Lord Jesus, open up my mind. Open up my mind, meditating on the scripture. Meditating on your scripture. Something new every single time. And every single time. Before we get into God's word, we're going to pray. Holy Father, we come to you again in Jesus' mighty name. And Father, we just we thank you for allowing us to come together uh, with the safety in this nation to be able to study your word, Lord God. Uh, we thank you for how you've drawn us to yourself so that we might know you more and, to, and be known by you more. And so as we read your words, we just pray that you help us to understand that you open our minds and our hearts, write these things on our hearts and on our minds so that we can live them out in our lives, so that we can be encouraged by them, uplifted by them, to be matured by them, uh, and, and, and to take up heart and faith whenever the world decides to throw whatever it does at us, that we know the God in whom we trust because of how often we read your word and, and, and study. And so we thank you for your, we thank you for your blessings, oh God, and, and just how you watch over us and, and bring us to this point in our lives where we are now. And um, again, we just uh, invite you into this place. We invite you into this study. We ask that you be our teacher, you be our guide through the scriptures, um, and that you would train us and teach us whatever it is that you delight for us to know, for us to, to pick up. That I know and have faith, Father, that you can speak to each and every one of us individually, even through the same words, the same sentences, that everyone will get the, the specific thought and message that you desire for them to receive, Lord God. And so we thank you for being our awesome teacher. Uh, we bless you and give you all the glory and honor in this time. And all these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Chapter five says, sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for the one for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there is in Jerusalem near the sheep gate, a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Okay. So this is a very special place. Right. Pools and colonnades is a place where people would come to wash. It was like streams of water running through, um, you know, and this place was designed when the people uh, had come back to Israel after their exile. OK, they had priests and common people that were working together to rebuild Jerusalem, to rebuild the temple. And during that time, they built uh this the these pools and colonnades for all the people this was a public place that anyone could go to and wash and and get cleaned right and so it says here a great number of disabled people used to lie they used to lie down the blind the lame and paralyzed right now it says again you got all these people that would all, they're, they're all dealing with some infirmity of some kind. And they stay close to the streams of water. Okay? They need to, they need to wash to become clean. All right? And so, and, and, and there's a very special thing that takes place that we're going to discuss in, in, in a moment. And so it says, One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years, okay? When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? So here's a guy, can't even move his body, okay? And, and in, order to, in order to wash himself or to do anything for himself, right? 
So Jesus says, do you want to get well? He says, sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I was trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. But Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. Okay, so we're going to stop right there, right? When, when the, the word of God, there, there are other um, translations that add some manuscripts that may not be in the early, the earliest manuscripts of the word of God that we have, right? So that's to say that they had different copies of the book of John. Over time, some people added a couple verses that may not have been there in the original text, the original manuscripts. And those versions will say that um, they believe, the people of that particular region believed that when the waters were stirred, the man said that it was an angel of God that came down and stirred the waters. And whoever went to the water when it was stirred would get healed because the angel, you know, like blessed the waters, right? That's what they believe based on this particular manuscript. But from what we come to understand, because the earlier copies of the of the Gospel of John do not have this account in it, we don't ultimately receive it as authentic gospel, right? And there is another way of explaining this that's in the, the Word of God, okay? So when I talked earlier about how those pools and colonnades were made when the people came back. The word of God tells us directly that there was priests who were the ones that built the sheep gate and they anointed the sheep gate. Okay. And so just from that concept of, uh, alone that we get from, from what's being told to us. And I believe that's either in Ezra or Nehemiah. One of those books deals with when the people came back to build the temple and to build the wall of Jerusalem and they built pools and colonnades. Anyway, because the priests blessed that pool, they blessed that colonnade, God can heal people, right? Because of that anointing that is on the gate, that is on the pool. So anyone who walks through, if they have faith in God, could be healed. Okay, and it may not have anything to do with an angel who came and stirred the waters. Okay, however, I mean, you you guys can go dig deep and do your own research. Pray to God to find out what's really happening with those manuscripts. But just from what I understand in the word of God, the fact that those priests bless that gate, that anybody who walked through there with faith can be healed. Not everybody would do that. But I'm just saying, God's anointing is powerful, okay? And so he, he could have healed that man any time if that man had faith for that reason. But now Jesus himself heals this man, right? How do you tell a man who can't move? Yo, get up, take your mat and walk, right? But this man, didn't, he didn't look at Jesus and said, man, what are you, crazy? No, it says at once. He got up, you know, when he heard Jesus say what he said, he believed and he moved. He tried to move and he moved and he got up and he was cured. And so it says the day on which this took place was a Sabbath. And so the Jewish leaders said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. OK, and so of all things that these guys could go on about, they're going to argue that he shouldn't be carrying his mat because of what day it was. Not even realizing this guy couldn't even move a little while ago. OK, so it says, but he replied, the man who made me well said to me, pick up your mat and walk. So they asked him. Who is this fellow who told you to pick up, pick it up and walk? The man who, who was healed had no idea who it was for Jesus has slipped away into the crowd that was there. How awesome, how, you know how, how 
if you study the, the previous gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus tells us when you do good deeds, don't sound a trumpet to let everybody know, oh, look at me, I'm giving money to the poor. Oh, look at me, I'm helping somebody do something, right? But he tells you, do your good deeds in secret. And here we have a, a direct situation where Jesus himself is showing us just that. You know, a lot of times this is what he did. He, he healed this cat. And then he just bounced off in secret and didn't, he didn't let everybody know, oh, I'm doing this. I'm the one doing this. Not everybody. Right? And so it says, later, Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, see, you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. This is the man went away and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had made him well. Okay. And so again. Jesus healed this man and comes to give him a word afterwards and tells him, yo, cut it out. Straight up. Stop sinning or else something worse can happen to you. So it seems that just by that dialogue alone, that whatever reason that man was invalid, possibly it was because of sin. Something that he had done in his life made him that way okay and so this to me would be the reason why jesus says yo cut it out or something else something worse might happen okay and so then once he realizes who it was he goes and he tells the jewish leaders it was jesus right 16. so because jesus was doing these things on the sabbath the Jewish leaders began to persecute him. Okay, so again, let's go back to that, right? They see this guy carrying his mat on the Sabbath day and they rebuke him because according to the law on the Sabbath day, which is the day that God blessed in Genesis, is the seventh day of the week is the day that God blessed. To us, we would consider that Saturday, right? God blessed that day and made it holy. He separated it from the rest of the days of the week. Because on it, he was he had completed all his work. It was, he was done with his work. And so he gave that day in the law to his people as a day where we can rest. We can work for our living six days of the week. And on the seventh day, we can have rest in him. What God really meant by us not working on the Sabbath was us not going to work in our regular nine to five jobs. Okay. God wanted us to have a day of rest and also for the land to have rest. He wanted for everything to have rest, even the animals. But when we didn't go out and work the field, that means your ox got to rest, right? Your donkeys, whatever other creatures that you used in terms of survival at work, everything got to rest. And God, that's what God wanted. But now these guys are trying to say that by this man carrying his mat, that he was violating this law that God had established among the people, which is absolutely absurd. But the problem with the leaders of this day was that they were so afraid that God was going to judge them harshly that they went to the extreme of on keeping every single law. So it's like this, if the law of God is a fence, right? That, that protects you. It's a wall that protects you. What these guys did was they built a fence inside the wall so that you can't even breach the wall at all. You don't even get close to the wall. And they established teachings and rules and traditions among themselves that they, that they treated as equal to God's law. And, and this is one of those things that we encounter that causes problems among the people where they're trying to tell this man that he's sinning because he's carrying his mat when that has nothing to do with the original law that God established. They went too far. Okay, and so, so it says, so, so because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jewish leaders began to persecute him. In his defense, Jesus said to them, my father is always at his work to this very day, and I too am working. For this reason, they tried all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, 
but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal to God. If you're gonna, you may encounter people out there who say, oh, you know, Jesus isn't equal to God. Or he's not God himself right but that he's just the son of god there are some people who believe these things that that jesus was just a man however when you study these books you'll come to understand jesus is directly telling you that he's equal to god that he is god the very beginning of this book says that he is god and he became flesh and made his dwelling among us and if you read the the letters of his students they also testify that he was God incarnate, that he was with us, right? So 19 is it. Jesus gave them this answer. Very truly, I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. He can only, he can do only what he sees his father doing, right? The same way that it is on the earth. When our sons watch us do something, they emulate that behavior and they start to do those things that they see us doing, right? So Jesus is giving us an illustration that we can understand, okay? So even for him, right? He was in heaven with the father and he saw the things that the father did. So now he can, he's the one who can show us these things here on earth, right? So, and, and he tells you, he doesn't do anything of himself but only what the father did. For the father loves the son and shows him all he does. Yes, and he will show him even greater works than these so that you will be amazed. For just as the father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the son gives life to whom he is pleased to give it. Right? Moreover, the father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the son, that all may honor the son just as they honor the father. The same way you honor God in heaven, it's the same way you honor Jesus Christ. Why? Because he is with the father. He is of the father. The two are one and the Holy Spirit also. Okay. It says... Whoever does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him. And this was a hard truth for the Jews to accept, right? They only ever understood that God was going to send someone, right? Who was going to teach them about the things of God, who was going to save them from their sins. But they didn't really uh, receive what it was that God was saying that he himself was going to come into his creation. Okay. So for them to hear that this man is making himself equal to God was absurd in their, in their eyes. It says very truly, I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes in him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life, right? Because the son has the same power as the father, okay? And this is exactly what Jesus is saying. Just like the father gives life, so the son gives life. And think about it this way, right? A lot of us know on the earth that there are fathers who may pass their companies to their children. They may pass their, their property to their children. And so the son then has the authority over the things that belong to the father okay and just as they saw their father do they do also and that is simple enough for us to understand and jesus is telling us it's, it works the same way between him and the father in heaven 25 very truly i tell you a time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the son of god and those who hear will live for as the father has life in himself so he has granted the son also to have life in himself and he has given authority to judge because he is the son of man the reason that he has authority to judge is because he was born as one of us okay 
And that's very awesome. So here's what God the Father has in mind with, with saying this right here. You see, if I judge them, they're going to say, oh, this God doesn't know what it's like to be one of us. He doesn't know how hard it is to be born as a human and to live this life and being tempted by everything and not and not engaging in something evil, right? They would look at God and say, it's not fair because you don't know what it's like to be one of us. So what did God do? He got the one up on everybody, right? He said, no, I'm going to I'm going to be born as a man and live this life according to my own commands and instructions so that I can judge you because I was one of you and you can't say anything about it. Okay, and so if you, and if you study the New Testament in the book of Hebrews, he goes on to say, you know, we have a high priest, right? Who can sympathize with us. Okay, he, he why? Because he was one of us. And so very awesome, very awesome stuff. And so God renders that judgment to the son. He won't even do it himself because he wasn't one of us. And that's just awesome. I mean, what king have you ever heard allow that to be done, right? None. It said, do not be amazed at this. For a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice. And that's the time that still hasn't come yet, right? They'll all hear his voice and come out. Those who have done what is good will rise to live. And those who have done what is evil will rise to be condemned. Okay. By him, by myself, I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear and my judgment is just. For I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. And so once the father makes known every soul of every person, you know, He'll, he'll rightly know how to judge each person, okay? He's basically saying, I'm not doing this of myself or of my own will. I'm going to wipe everything that I know blank and just let the Father tell me what's what, okay? So, so as to please the Father, to do His will rather than my own. Because being a man, what God wants us to understand is not to live according to our own will right? But to live according to the will of the Father. And so Jesus is bringing himself under that stipulation, under that law uh, of relationship between him and the Father. Why? Because that's what he wants us to emulate. He wants us to do the same thing. Okay? Now, Jesus said, if I testify about myself, my testimony is not true. There is another who testifies in my favor. And I know that his testimony about me is true. Now, if Jesus said, I testify about myself, if I testify about myself, my testimony is not true. Is Jesus saying that he's a liar? Absolutely not. But according to God's law, the testimony of two or three witnesses can be held as true and legitimate. Right? If, if, if somebody went and murdered another person, that person can come back and say, I ain't do it. It wasn't me. Is his testimony valid? No, it can't be valid, right? Which is the reason why God said it has to be the testimony of two or three witnesses, okay? Or else you can't hold a matter to be true. So this is the reason why Jesus says this. But he says, but there is another who testifies in my favor. And I know that his testimony about me is true. He said, you have sent to John. He's talking about John the Baptist. And he has testified to the truth. Not that I accept human testimony, but I mention it that you may be saved, right? Jesus said, I know that all of you people on the earth are evil. So I don't respect, you know, your testimony, but that don't mean that John is lying. And since you guys are the same as him, right? You're not God incarnate, but he's a man just like your regular men. You can, you can receive his testimony because you are the same. You understand the difference between Jesus and the rest of us, right? Okay, so he says, John was a lamp that burned and gave light. And you chose for a time to enjoy his light. I have testimony weightier than John, right? He said, my testimony is heavier than his, right? For the works that the Father has given me to finish, 
the very works that I am doing testify that the Father has sent me. Right? When did John raise somebody from the dead? When did John the Baptist turn water into wine? Right? When did when did he do these things? You see, he, his works might be awesome, preaching to people and washing the people and preparing them to to come back to God. But the things that Jesus is doing, like you cannot deny that the Father sent him to do these things and that the Father is with him. Okay. So yeah, the things that Jesus does is heavier than than the things that John the Baptist does. And the Father who sent me has himself testified concerning me. So you have heard his voice. I'm sorry, you have never heard his voice nor seen his form, nor does his word dwell in you. For you do not believe the one he sent. It says you study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me. Yet you refuse to come to me to have life. So Jesus is telling them, like, you guys hold on to the words of God because you think that you have eternal life in them. But everything that those words say is about me. And yet you still reject me. And so, again, if they truly were open to what God was saying in the words, they would see all over the entire scrolls of the past Jesus is, is flooded all throughout them. everybody there's so many stories of the prophets of the past of the people of the past that match everything that the Messiah was going to go through what he came to do you know just like we were talking about Moses a little while ago the the the, the bronze serpent that was raised up that anybody who looked at it if the snakes bit them they wouldn't die and that points to Jesus Christ. Jesus said the same way I'm going to be lifted up and anybody who looks at me won't die. Right. And so he tried to tell them straight up, you guys missed it. You missed it. Now, when he says the father himself testified about him, if you remember when he got baptized and the spirit of God came down on him, those who were present heard the voice said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. But he's telling them they didn't hear it because they didn't believe. And so 41, he said, I do not accept glory from human beings, but I know you. I know that you do not have the love of God in your hearts. I have come in my father's name and you do not accept me. But if someone else comes in his own name, you will accept him. How can you believe since you accept glory from one another, but do not seek the glory that comes from the only God. Okay, so yeah, you guys praise each other how good you are, right? But you should rather seek the glory that comes from God alone. And you notice here, for those of us who encounter um, these situations in the world, right? I'm gonna touch on something that for people who may know the word of God a little better, who are more advanced in their studies. Notice here that Jesus said, I have come in my father's name, right? And people and other people come in their own name. And, and uh, in the body of Christ, there's a lot of people who argue about the name of God, right? Oh, you have to say this name. You have to say it this in this language or with this. And it's like, well, why didn't Jesus say that right here? Why, instead of saying my father's name, why didn't he just say yod heh vav -he, or Yahweh or, or however he might have pronounced it, right? And so, you know, again, when you come to read the scriptures and you, and you see this figure of the name that's brought out, when to do something in someone's name means to do it in honor of them or representation of them, all right? And so when you come to study the scriptures, don't don't be so far taken by these people who try to make you feel like if you're not doing it in this name, using this name, then then you're 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 following a false teaching and you're not really saved. OK. Again, just right here, you can ask that question to somebody. Well, why did he say I do this in my father's name? Why didn't he just say the name? OK. And so if you're trying to build apologetics, what it is to defend the faith that you have, 
here you go. So uh, another arrow for, for your quiver, right? So he said, but do not think I will accuse you before the Father. Your accuser is Moses, on whom your hopes are set. If you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. Okay, and so now, it's like, what books did Moses write? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Jesus is telling you straight up, Moses wrote about him. What? Where in his books is he talking about Jesus? Okay. So now you got some homework to do. You go back and read those books. And I guarantee you, if you know the life of Jesus, the more you know about the things that Jesus did, the things that he said, okay? And you go back and read those books, you'll see Jesus all over the place. It's phenomenal. And always pray that God guides you through the scriptures, that the Holy Spirit will show you, teach you, and open your mind to understand the things that you're reading. I, t I tell people all the time, be weary of Bibles that have commentaries, right? Because a lot of times you'll get these men who are, who are fixated on, or have a propaganda and agenda to, to take people to, do, to, to learn from them and to follow their ways to do the things that they want uh, their students to do, okay? I'm gonna tell you the same way Jesus said, you don't, you don't need a teacher other than the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will be your teacher. So if you trust God and believe what he said, take that to heart and pray that, that the Holy Spirit guides you when you study the words, okay? And I guarantee you, he'll open up the scriptures like no one else. I always pray for God to give me things that nobody else has. Show me nuggets, gems of gold, you know, so, so special things that no one has ever uncovered yet. And, and I'm telling you, every time I study God's word, my mind is blown. But anyway, so, so he says, but since you do not believe what he wrote, how are you going to believe what I say? Okay, and so straight up, Jesus said, you know what, you guys are so bent on the law of Moses, the law of Moses. He said, well, guess what? When you stand before God, your accuser is going to be Moses, the one that you put all your hopes on. Okay, and so, you know, remembering that, that, same, that same thing, if we put our hopes on Jesus, he's the one that, we're, that is going to stand for us or against us, right? If I'm here teaching and proclaiming Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, and I don't live as one of his students. When I stand before him, he's going to be my accuser. You put all your hopes in me, but you live like Satan. You live like the devil. So now I'm your accuser. Or he can be my defender. That I live to him, and when I stand before God, he's, he's going to acknowledge me before God because I acknowledged him before men by living my life according to his teachings obeying the gospel and following him. John chapter six. And so it says, sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover was near, okay? And we had talked about what um, the Jewish Passover was in our previous studies. Um, again, that this Passover festival goes all the way back to the days of Moses, right? When the people of Israel were slaves in Egypt and God had freed the people from the land, the king of, of the nation, who was called Pharaoh, was resisting God's move of allowing the people to go and worship him. So God demonstrated with a mighty hand of judgment by um, bringing a plague of death to all the firstborn sons of Egypt, okay, in order to prove to Pharaoh that he was God, um, that he, he, he caused for death to, uh, or an angel of death to go through uh, the land of Egypt and destroy all the firstborn of Egypt. However, 
anyone who didn't cover the, the doorposts of their homes with the blood of the lamb, right, was not covered by the blood, their firstborn sons would also be destroyed. So God commanded the people of Israel to hold a festival. And in that festival, they slaughtered a lamb and they, they took the lamb's blood. They covered the doorposts with the blood so that when the angel saw the blood on the doorposts, he would pass over that, that home. Okay, and so that's what the, the festival of Passover represents, okay? And so anyway, this was a, a, a festival that God commanded the people to keep annually every year, okay? They kept the Passover festival. All right, so we know it was around this time that Jesus was out there doing these things, okay? And we'll see as we go, the course of Jesus' ministry is three years, all right? So you'll see this occasion pass, so pass again and again. And finally, up until we see Jesus crucified and resurrected, all right? But anyway, so this is still early on in his ministry. So verse five says, uh, this is chapter six of John, verse five. Now it says, when Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. All right. Now, think about what that means for us. If Jesus is asking one of his disciples a question just to test him, okay, then Jesus will do the same thing with us to test our faith, to test where our heart really is for him, all right? A lot of people don't um, always see their relationship with Jesus to be this way, but if God gave you an assurance that he was going to be with you during that event that you're going to, that that interview you know that that job that whatever it was whatever it is that you might be going to right and you begin to waver in your particular faith that means that you haven't trusted that god was going to be with you right so a lot of times you know we may we may not understand how he works in relationship with us because we don't have the presence of his being right uh in a physical form, the way Jesus was with his disciples. We have to learn the presence of God in spirit to understand how he is with us, how we walk with him always, you know, how he's always with us. How we can talk to him wherever we are, wherever we're at, right? Anyway, so Jesus is here asking his disciple a question only to test him because he already knew what he was gonna do. But he said, where should we buy bread for these people to eat, right? Verse 7, and Philip answered him, it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two fish. And, and how far will they go among so many? Okay. And so again, you've been seeing that there was a multitude of people this guy, Andrew, says, oh, I found a kid who got five loaves of bread and two fish, right? But how far can that go to feed the people, right? But it didn't stop Andrew from bringing this kid up. It didn't stop Andrew from showing the Lord what, whatever they had, right? It wasn't like he looked at it and said, man, that's not enough, so I'm not even going to bring it up. No, he saw whatever they had, and that's what he brought to the Lord. Sometimes that's the way we got to be, whatever you got. Whatever you whatever you got, don't be afraid to bring it to the Lord because he can use it. Whoever you are, you might think you're insignificant, but the Lord can use it. And, that, and he shows us that constantly throughout scripture. If you have the faith of a mustard seed, God can use you to change the nation. He can use you to change the kingdom. Understand? All right, so anyway, verse 10, Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place and they sat down, about 5,000 men were there, right? And notice it just mentions the men, not including women and children. 
So it says, Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. Okay, and so just taking what little they had, all right, Jesus took and gave to everyone, thousands of people, as much as they needed, right? It says, when they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. Okay, and so if you know anything about the Lord, he, he doesn't want anything to go uh, to be wasted, right? And so, again, if we look at other instances in scripture where the bread represents the body of our Messiah, right? The bread represents his body, okay? He doesn't want that to be wasted on anyone, right? And so... And then he takes what little there was and makes it enough. And so if you see, yes, Jesus was one man, but that one man provided salvation for all of humanity. You understand? And so he can take what little there was and multiply it. 13. So they gathered them and fill 12 baskets with the pieces of five barley loaves left over by those who had who had eaten okay and again there's no um insignificant numbers in scripture right as we study the word of god we're going to find out that five is representative of certain things throughout throughout the scripture right if you study the book of genesis it says on the fifth day is when God created the fish, all right? And so now we see that there, that there was five loaves and two fish here at this particular feeding. 5,000 people present in the gathering, all right? And so, um, and then what happens? After he's given them to all, the leftovers that were collected fill 12 baskets, okay? And so we see 12 is significant of the God's people. Right. There were 12 tribes of, of the people of Israel. OK. And so you'll see that um, now now Jesus is taking the invitation of God's people that was limited to only Israel and extending it right beyond. OK. And so it says 14. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say. Surely this is the prophet who has come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself, right? Because it was not yet his time to be revealed in such a way. And again, it was not the will of God for Jesus to assume kingship at this particular time. So Jesus said, no, 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 I'm not going to let myself get caught up in that, right? He wasn't going to render himself to these people who would force him to become king. And again, it's, it mentions here that this is the prophet who has come into the world. Remember, they were waiting for a prophet to come. Okay, and if you study, um, you study the book of Exodus, right? Numbers, Deuteronomy, that has to do with Moses. Moses told the people that God was going to send them a prophet like him, okay? A prophet like him, and that they must do everything that that prophet commands. And so we see that they're recognizing Jesus to be that one. Now, now obviously, we know Jesus is more than a prophet, right? But he does fulfill the office of prophet also, okay? And so... They're, they're basically testifying here. This is the one that Moses told us to expect. And we should do whatever he has commanded us to do. That's exactly what Moses um, had told them. And it's interesting. They call him the prophet, which the scripture says exactly that, right? You must do whatever he commands you to do. 
if you remember going back to John chapter 2, at the wedding in Cana, when, when the mother of Jesus tells him, they have no wine. And Jesus tells her, what does that have to do with me? It's not my time yet. She looks at the servants and says, do whatever he tells you to do. And that particular phrase you're going to find throughout the Old Testament in several places. Do whatever he tells you to do. And for those of you who understand what a Christ type is, it's when um, Jesus has appeared in the form of a different uh, character. That's something another person has lived out right, resembles what the Messiah was coming to do, okay, like a Christ type, so anyway, you'll see that all these Christ types in the Old Testament emulate Jesus, and, the, and, and that one phrase is like an identifier, it helps you to understand, like, oh, snap, I know that they said, do whatever he tells you to do, that points to the Messiah, so this guy may have some Christ type um, characteristics about him, okay? And, and basically all that is to say is that what God does by teaching us through the word is that he prepared us to understand Jesus when he came, right? And how he did that was that he showed us in the past things about Jesus over and over again, not just prophecy, Right. Where people say, oh, yeah, he told us um, about the future. He predicted the coming of this person. Not just that, but there are people who, when you read their lives, things that they actually experienced were the same as what Jesus was coming to do. And that's how, you know, prophecy is more than just predictions. It is a pattern as well. OK. And the more you study scripture, the more apparent those things will be as you continue reading through the word of God. Okay, so, <clears throat> oh yeah, 616. When evening came and his disciples went down to the lake, it said, where they got into a boat and set off across the lake for Capernaum. By now it was dark and Jesus had not yet joined them. A strong wind was blowing and the waters grew rough. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water, and they were frightened. But he said to them, it is I, don't be afraid. Then they were willing to take him into the boat and immediately the boat reached the shore where they were, where they were heading. Now think about that. <clears throat> These guys get into a boat, his disciples, his students, get into a boat. They sail three or four miles inward towards wherever the next place they were going to. And they did this because what Jesus most likely told them, yo, go on ahead, I'll meet you there. Trust that I'm gonna be there. So they went. And now Jesus shows up walking on the water. And so we see that this is just one testimony about this particular event. And there are the other gospels cover the testimony of this particular event also. But one thing that John gives you that Jesus said out of his own mouth, don't be afraid, right? Because he is there, it is him. And if you, if you look at um, other scriptures where Jesus shows up, even in prophetic form, right? Something so awesome happens around these people when they see Jesus in his glorified form and he puts his hand on them and tells them, do not be afraid. Okay, and so this is an identifier of Jesus Christ. Perhaps he'll show up to you in a certain form one day and you'll be, you'll be you know, out of your, out of your uh, comfort zone in fear. Like, yo, what is happening? Who is this that's standing in front of me? And when he puts his hand on you and tells you to not be afraid, remembering that this is what Jesus says, you'll know who it is that's talking, okay? Because 
as much as we are so into our lives right now, the time is coming where Jesus is going to come. He's going to appear. And we, each of us, will have our encounter with him. And then it would be very real <laughs> for us to know what this means. But if Jesus shows up and tells you, don't be afraid, you ain't got nothing to worry about. It says then, oh, I'm sorry, they were willing to get, uh, to take him into the boat, right? And I could imagine what they were thinking, seeing this guy walking on water. But, but if you understand, again, Going back into the book of Genesis, the very first time you'll see water in the scene is that when the spirit of God was hovering over the waters, right? And he says, let there be light. And there was light. Like you see now Jesus walking on this water and is demonstrating that he has mastery over the spirit realm. Okay. That he is master of creation. He is the one who created all things. There's a reason that we sink because water does not yield to us, but water yields to Jesus Christ. Okay, 22, it says, the next day, the crowd that had stayed on the opposite shore of the lake realized that only one boat had been there and that Jesus had not entered it with his disciples, but they had gone, oh, I'm sorry, but they had gone away alone. Then some boats from Tiberias landed near the place where the people had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. Once the crowd realized that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and went to Capernaum in search of Jesus, right? So the people who saw the disciples leave on the boats, but Jesus remained with them. Now they hear that Jesus is on the other side. So they're like, yo, we gotta go after him, right? Just like anything else, when you turn on a light, the moths or the insects in the atmosphere, they go after the light, right? You throw a breadcrumb in the sea and all the fish will swim up to that breadcrumb. And this is what's happening. Jesus is the light. Jesus is the bread, okay? 25, when they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? But Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Because the, the bread that he gave them filled them. Okay. And that's it. And he's telling them straight up, you're not following me because you saw a miraculous sign of wonder, but because you ate and were filled. And, you know, think about how easy it is for us to go to a supermarket and have all the food that we can possibly imagine at our disposal, right? These people didn't live in a time like that. And then I'm, I'm absolutely certain that the less fortunate members of their society would starve, right? People had to pay taxes they couldn't afford um, and, 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 and couldn't survive. And here, this prophet is given out giving out bread and fish that fills them. So he tells them straight up, you, you only came after me because of the bread. He said, do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the son of man will give you. For on him, God the father has placed his seal of approval. Okay, so telling you straight up, like, if you're living this life to be prosperous, to get rich or die trying, right? To, to basically just survive for this world, you're missing the point, right? You're missing God's purpose and God's design. And so that's his reason for saying, don't work for food that's spoils. Obviously, for those, those of us who have families, we have to sustain. Yeah, we work to provide for our families. But Jesus is telling us that's not the purpose of this life, right? So the things that we should work toward are those things which have an eternal value, 
right? Which basically means whatever it is to surrender to the will of God, that's the true work of our lives. 28 says, then they asked him, what must we do to do the work God requires? But Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. Okay? And so, again, you'll have all these religions on earth that will tell you, you know, you have to travel here, offer this and offer that, do this and do that. But with God, you must receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. This one is the cure for our sickness, the cure for our disease, right? And there is no other cure. And so, and then to believe on him is to do whatever he tells you to do. If you truly believe in Jesus, then you'll you'll follow as his disciples did. And that and and that comes with things that you would naturally do right to communicate with God anyway. When you when you want to talk to God, what do you do? You pray, right? Praying is what Jesus disciples do. Okay? In order to have a relationship with with Jesus, right? Jesus commanded them to take his body, to take his blood into their bodies. This is um the 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 supper that by design he had his his disciples do in order to in order to understand that they are one with the Lord. His disciples did these things, right? The same thing, getting being baptized as a believer, right? Allowing yourself to 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 um do this emblematic washing where you die with Christ and come out of the water a new a new person as Christ right Romans chapter 6 tells you when you're baptized in the Lord that you you die with him and you're raised with him and it's not always the same for every believer some people will be baptized by the Holy Spirit immediately so others will receive the Holy Spirit in the baptism pool right others even after that event regardless of how it is that you're baptized by the Holy Spirit, the word of God tells us, let us be baptized right in the water, like all of believers. Okay. And this is again, just to fulfill all righteousness. You understand? These are things that those who follow Jesus and believe in him did. And so if we um, desire to be true disciples of Jesus Christ, then we're just going to follow to the best of our ability, whatever he commanded us to do. Okay. And so the work of God is to believe in the one. So they asked him, what sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. But Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven. But it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me and still you do not believe. All those the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me that I shall lose none of those, uh, none of all those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life. And I will raise them up at the last day, right? 
Notice you can you have to look up at to him and believe in him. Right? And we know true faith prompts action, right? He's calling, but you have to respond. 41, it says, At this, the Jews there began to grumble about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? And this because, again, they did not understand the way that Jesus was going to appear, right? They think, oh, you know, we're waiting for a Messiah who's going to show up as a king, as a ruler, as a mighty warrior. He's going to free us from the, the slavery and subservience to Rome. And, and then, you know, he's going to be uh, our king and God among us at that time. They didn't, they didn't want to remember the scriptures that said he was going to be born like one of us. Humble, right? In humility, he was going to show up. Okay? And that he would suffer many things on the earth. When it came to those scriptures, they just put those to the side. Right? And, it, and it's funny because in the church today, you'll see many people do the same thing today. They'll, they'll, they'll receive only the scriptures that tickle their ears that they like to hear and the other half of the scripture they put to the side i don't want to hear that right and so you know either you have the entire word or you have nothing right so anyway jesus is letting them know who he is and they don't receive him because they don't understand they think oh we know this guy he's from perth and boy like god the, god the, god's gonna send us a messiah from perth and boy get real but God, God would do exactly something like that, right? He would give you a person who you would least likely expect to be his representation on earth. Just to see, just to test you, to see if you would receive him or not, right? If you're a racist person, he's going to show up the opposite race that you, that you hate. Just, just to, again, teach you something, right? It said, you know, you get people out there, they want Jesus to be white, they want Jesus to be black. He's gonna show up purple and say, what now? Can you receive me now, right? Does it matter? Because Jesus is not uh, solely flesh and blood. He was a spirit being before he ever came into a body, right? And so our political correctness, the politics we follow on earth mean nothing when it comes to him. When he came, he wasn't down here pushing the agenda for the Jewish people. He was pushing an agenda for the Father in heaven. And he tells us, you know, disconnect from your agendas to your people, your, your nation, your school, your whatever. Disconnect from that. I need you to be born again. And so we need to cut the ties to everything that ties us here to this world, to this body of flesh. You know, by, by descent, I would be a Puerto Rican man but I don't claim anything from Puerto Rico. You know, it, when it comes to them, they want to celebrate something, y'all go ahead. I'm from a different kingdom. I represent my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He's the only one. I'm a spirit being now, no longer according to the flesh, right? But then just like Paul, we use these things to our advantage. If me being a Puerto Rican man gives me a one up with them, then I'm going to use that to gain audience with them. So be it. Anyway, <clears throat> so now these guys were upset that Jesus said he is the bread that came down from heaven because they said, this is Joseph's son. We know this cat. How can he be what he's saying? So 43, he says, stop grumbling among yourselves. Jesus answered, no one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws them and I will raise them up at the last day, right? So this is the desire of the father, right? And of the son, he wants to receive everyone, right? That's given to him. Now it's our responsibility to accept that call and to follow through, right? Notice how it says, it says that he won't lose it. He won't drive anyone away who comes to him. 
But you know what? You can walk away from God. And that's one thing that in the church now, they want to make you think, oh, no, once you come to the Lord, it don't matter how you live. He's just going to accept you in any form. But then you have so many scriptures that tell you, you better keep your garments clean. You better walk out your faith with fear and trembling. Okay, you need to be obedient to the Lord, obedient to the gospel. All right, and so it's like, well, who do I listen to? Do I listen to what these guys are saying or what the Lord is telling me directly from his word? And it's like, you either have all of the word or none, or none of it. Okay, so he tells you guys straight up, stop grumbling among yourselves, Jesus answered. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them, and I will raise them up at the last day. It is written in the prophets. They will all be taught by God. And everyone who has heard the Father and learned from him comes to me. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only he has seen the Father. So only Jesus can teach us about the, the, the real deep truths of the Father because he came from the Father, right? Only he can show us the Father because he saw the Father and does everything the Father does, okay? And so when we look at everything Jesus is testifying about, sharing with us that the prophets told us that these things were, were going to happen, Right. You'll see other other religions in the world, other belief systems. They may call God father. But the scripture, Jesus tells us straight up, only those who know him know the father. So if Jesus is not in association with these other belief systems. Right. They don't they, they don't lead to the truth. OK, that belief system cannot bring you to God, regardless of what anyone else says. And so it's just like anything else, right? I know this brother here. If someone was to come up to me and say, oh, yeah, do you, you know this guy, Darius? I know him. He's about eight feet tall. He's got blue skin. <laughs> you know, his eyes are red. <laughs> and, 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 you know, he, he wears a. Uh, 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 a tank top all the time. And I'm like, you think you know Darius, but you don't know the Darius that I know. And that's the problem in the world. A lot of times, a lot of people go around talking about how they know Jesus, how they know of Jesus, right? And then when they describe him, it, it, he does not match the true Jesus of the word of God, okay? And so for us to understand who the true Jesus is, you have to study your word. Not just to receive it from what other people may tell you, right? But to study it for yourself. So anyway, because he's the only way to the Father. And that's the whole point to even mention any of that, right? So 47 said, very truly, I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the whole world. Okay. And so earlier we saw Jesus saying, right, that he has food that no one knows about. And they said, well, did somebody bring him something to eat? Did, did he sneak some food with him? Or his, he, he told his disciples, my food is to do the work of my father, right? And so you understand Jesus is speaking in a spiritual wavelength, right? For those of us who can discern things spiritually by, by him giving us this ability to understand spiritual things, to have spiritual discernment, what he really means. Right. Jesus is telling you, if you receive him as Lord and Savior, if you receive the fact that God gave him as our bread, the flesh that he gave for the whole world. OK, that this is how you truly believe in him. This is how you eat his flesh, how you eat. It's not like 
any of us could really eat the actual flesh of the Messiah because he's he's gone. He he went up, it, you know, and it's not like for every believer, he comes down and cuts a piece of his skin off and gives it to you to eat, right? No, it doesn't work like that. And so he told us by faith, by faith, we receive him and what he's done, right? By the testimony of the witnesses who wrote these things, that's us receiving the gospel, receiving the message of the good news, believing, acting, being prompted into action and belief. This is how we eat the flesh of our Messiah, which is his body, which was broken for us on our behalf. Okay. And so if we eat from Jesus, if, if you guys have a true relationship with Jesus Christ, I promise you, you ain't hungry for any other God. You ain't hungry for any other prophet. You ain't thirsty for any other drink because Jesus fills you, okay? And so this I testify for myself. When I accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, I didn't want to eat anything else. Jesus was enough and more than enough, overflowing of enough. Okay, and so when Jesus said, if you, if you eat this flesh, you'll never hunger again. You'll never thirst again if you drink from him. And it's so true, so true. I'll tell you what, I've been a believer for about 20 plus years now. I ain't running after anybody else. Still teaching Jesus. All right, so 52, it says, Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? But Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. Now that's that's an awesome statement, right? But he said, just as the Father is in him, and he lives because of the Father, so those of us who eat him will live because of him, because the Father is in him. And so, again, there's no way to put Jesus to the side. You cannot have God without Jesus Christ. Okay? And he tells us straight up, his flesh is real food. His blood is real drink. Okay? And, and, and in the way that we understand what he's saying to us is so true. Right? There's a reason why only one man could offer himself on the cross and notice if you study the scripture from the beginning right he had to be a son of adam which is why he calls himself the son of man right adama means man adam means man he's the son of man if he was a nephilim he couldn't offer himself up to us he had to be born of a human descent in order to provide a sacrifice for humans right a human life for a human life that's a proper payment, okay? And then you look at um, all the all the requirements that he had to fulfill, right? He had to be a son of Abraham. He had to be a son of David. He had to fulfill so many requirements throughout Scripture. It's it, it, it take you a lifetime to study all the things that Jesus fulfilled. But we do know that from from the ancestry that he came from, according to the scriptures, according to the eyewitness testimony, he came from the bloodline that God required, right? And again, it was, it, why? Because God made covenants with men. So he, he had to come from Abraham because he made the covenant through Abraham. He had to come from the line of David because he made the covenant through David. And David is of the, the the royal bloodline. And so Jesus has priestly blood, right? Prophetic blood and royal blood. And so we have a priest, 
king prophet who is our Messiah. And as you follow, as you follow his lineage from the beginning, okay, to when he shows up on the scene, fulfilling all these requirements, okay, God lets you know the body that he's providing is, is the one body sufficient to make atonement for mankind. And that's a very awesome thing. It's very complex to, to understand and wrap your mind around. But he is, um, you know, his flesh is true food. His blood is true drink. And even if, I guarantee, if we were to literally eat his flesh and drink his blood, there would be some miraculous something that would happen, you know? But anyway, I doubt very strongly that he's talking about literally eating him, right? We ain't cannibals. The scripture doesn't uh, promote cannibalism. Nothing of the sort, right? So anyway, um, but he is the bread that came down. He told them straight up that bread that your ancestors ate in the wilderness under Moses, right? Because remember, these people are ones that put all their hopes in Moses. And he said, well, Moses, you know, they ate the bread that came from heaven with Moses and they're all dead now, you know? But I guarantee you, if they eat this bread that came down, they'll live. They will live. Okay, and so we need to remember that our life down here is but a breath, right? This flesh is not promised anything special, but we're looking toward our spiritual life in God, the true life. This is just a simulation, right? We understand simulation by playing video games, right? When we when we played as Mario Brothers and we, we fell off into a, a, a hole and died, you know, we, we didn't fret because we knew, oh, well, that's just one man that I lost. Unfortunately, we only have one man in this simulation, but we live beyond this is my whole point in even bringing that up, right? If you understand a simulation, this is not the real, right? Your body here is not the real. It goes beyond this, okay? And that's what Jesus constantly tries to focus our attention on. Don't store up treasures here in this life that, that will be destroyed by, by rust and, and, and moths and whatever other things, right? Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven by doing eternal things, eternal works, believing in the one, doing the good deeds that he commanded us to do, and so on. All right, so anyway, moving on. Six, six, man, I didn't realize there was that many yeah. verses in this one chapter. So, yeah. All right, so he said, on hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it, right? Imagine if your teacher just starts, goes off and starts telling all these people who are following, like, yo, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you can't be my student. And your students are like, yo, master, you ain't never said that to me before, <laughs> like, I didn't know we was going to do this. I'm I'm out, right? <laughs> I don't do that, you know? But imagine. So they hear it and they're like, yo, this is a hard teaching. 61, he says, aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, does this offend you? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the spirit and life. The words that Jesus gave you are filled with the spirit and life. And this is why only Jesus provides these words. And this is why we never hunger or thirst, right? Yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled him. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Okay, so that was a breaking point for many people. Jesus may have had you know, 40, 70, who knows how many 
like students that have been following him around for a while. And now that number just dropped, right? So he says, you do not want to leave me too, do you? Jesus asked the 12. But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Okay, and so again, this is the response of a true follower, of a true believer. That when things get difficult to comprehend, right? When a situation arises that causes for you to go beyond yourself, right? Perhaps to do something for God that you would never do, okay? This is the response. Who else can we go to, right? If Jesus told me to walk through fire, I got to trust that he knows what's going to happen when I walk through the fire. I can't be concerned with being burned if I'm trying to be a follower of God. I know the fire is just an element of this simulation. It ain't, it ain't real. Even if I die in the fire, my soul's going to go to him anyway. It only hurts for a little while, you know, and that's the problem that we have here, down here. When we're hungry, man, we sell our souls. When we're thirsty, we sell our souls. You know, when we when we want something or when times get hard, man, we break under the pressure, we cut loose and run away. Okay? And God don't want followers like that who are gonna cut and run. All these people, they say, eat your flesh, drink your blood. You know what? I'm out. I can't do this because they didn't understand. They would not give God that faith of saying, I trust him. I, I may not fully understand what he's saying, but I trust him. Okay? And they cut and run. And so the real disciple said, where else are we going to go? I may not understand what you're saying, but I ain't going anywhere. I'm staying right here. Okay, so then Jesus replied, have I not chosen you, the 12? Yet one of you is a devil. And so he meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, who, though one of the 12, was later to betray him. And so Jesus was not shy in letting them know that there was one who was still among them who wasn't always real, right? He knew, yeah, all right, you 12 may, may, may not have run with the rest of the people that ran away, but one of you is still not true. One of you is a devil. And, and that will become manifest in time. And so, you know, in that in the last days, when Jesus comes and we all stand before him, he's going to let us know who the tares are among the wheat. That there might be people in the church who are devils just like Judas. They might think that they're true believers, but they don't really follow after Jesus. You know, and there are people in the church that when you tell them, yo, you better trust in God and not trust in man, right? I mean, just to give an example, you know, our world has just suffered some hardships out there. And this might be a hard thing for some people to understand, right? But when when COVID happened to the whole world and the doctors and the governments were like, yo, we have a cure. We have a cure for you. You seen people didn't even want to know what was in it, ran to go get it, didn't care. And it's like they they're the ones that instead of waiting praying about it, right? Seeing seeing what is really going on in the world. The, the word of God tells us that the governments of the world work for Satan, straight up. From one end of the word of God to the other end of the word of God, the governments of the world work for Satan, okay? Well, so all of a sudden we're gonna trust them because they said they got a cure for us when some sickness popped up around us, right? And even if this sickness is real, will we expect them to save us? You know what I mean? These are the same people that were doing like the Tuskegee experiments, just taking black folk and trying to, and putting some stuff in them and people were dying left and right, getting sick left and right. And this is like, oh, so that happened just a few years ago, but now we trust them. Now we're gonna accept the needle now, right? Give me a break. And so it's like, 
Jesus told us if we're trying to save our lives, we're going to lose it. But if we lose our lives for him, we'll find it. And so we, you know, we understand only Jesus saves. And, and his true disciples are going to wait for him. We're not going to fold and, and take whatever offer, whatever cure that, that the doctors are offering, that the governments are offering, science is offering. You know, Jesus don't want people like that. He wants us to hold out and be strong for his glory. All right. So anyway, we're going to leave it right there for, for today. I hope that you guys were blessed by the word. I know I truly was. Um, and and uh, we'll, we'll continue to put this meeting on from week to week as we can. And uh, let's go. Let's go. All right. Love you guys in the Lord. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance toward you and give you peace. God bless y'all. Scripture, meditating on your scripture. Lord Jesus, open up my mind. Open up my mind, meditating on the scripture. Meditating on your scripture. Something new every single time. And every single time. Blessed are the ones who meditate upon the words of God And the ones who take to heart what is written in them Each one is like a seed, taking its time to grow But at the harvest, the fruit is all of that and then some Every line is full of knowledge and wisdom Helping you to uproot the lies of the system Equipping you for every good work in the kingdom Preparing you and yours for the arrival of his son Scripture, meditating on your scripture Lord Jesus, open up my mind, open up my mind, meditating on the scripture, meditating on your scripture, something new every single time, and every single time. Whenever I read, there's always something new to learn. You open my mind to things that only you discern. Mysteries of your death and resurrection revealed in every section. The text bears your reflection from your infancy to your ascension. From your second coming, even unto eternity with the brethren. See, line for line, you told it all before it happened. Starting from when Eve ate and gave some to Adam. And that's when he made the choice to lay his life down. But you cursed him, sweating his eyes, thorns in the ground. Then you versed him upon the prophecy of the Lord who would sweat blood and be adorned with the crown of thorns. And what that means is that you knew from the beginning that you would trade yourself as an offering for his sinning. And like Adam, you would have to bleed to provide the death of your seed for the life of the bride. Come on, scripture, meditating on your scripture. Lord Jesus, open up my mind. Open up my mind, meditating on the scripture. Meditating on your scripture.